Thank you, everybody. Um, it's again my great pleasure, but in a different kind of way, to introduce our speaker for this evening's talk or lecture, whichever way you want it to be. <laughs> um, so we have Vasim Khan, um, who um, is going to be speaking to us on killing Gandhi, Dante's The Divine Comedy, and India's first female police detective. Perhaps the title gives a little bit away of the kind of direction that he's coming from. I know he's going to talk to you about, in a sense, what that direction is and, and, and what he does. So I don't want to spot, I don't want to introduce any spoilers whatsoever. So I'm going to just leave you with Vasim and listen to what I think is going to be a really interesting talk. So thank you. Thank you, Vasim, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Alison, for, for making this happen and for inviting me to come along. And thank you all for persisting, even after the AGM and, and still being here and, and, all those, <laughs> and all those who are uh, online. OK, so uh, I'm not an academic, uh, so lecture is probably grand, too grandiose a word for, for what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, this is a talk. I'm a writer. I'm a crime writer. And most of my talks are on the festival circuit, the literary circuit. Uh, but some, occasionally I'll, be, I'll, I'll come and do a talk off the beaten track. Now, this particular talk, I agreed to as soon as I was invited, uh, because there are certain connections to the last book that I wrote. And we will explore those in due course. And uh, a lot of the things that I, uh, that I believe in are, are based around connections and how we connect uh, the society that I was born in, which was the UK, and the society that I spent 10 years living in, which was India. And of course, we all know that the British and the Indians have enjoyed, might be too strong a word, but have had a 300 year odd connection. And that persists to this day uh, with great historical influences over, uh, over the way that we interact with each other. OK, so you've got the title there in front of you, Killing Gandhi, Dante's The Divine Comedy and India's First Female Police Detective. Uh, I'm a crime writer, so we're going to go on this journey together to India. But we're going to do it via a murder mystery. Here is our victim. Now, some of you, no doubt, not being my regular crime audience, will already know the perpetrator of this particular crime. Uh, but this is about the journey rather than the destination. So Mohandas, uh, Mohandas Karimchand Gandhi, aka the Mahatma, which means great soul, uh, as no doubt many of you know, he was the leader of the Indian National Congress uh, from 1921 onwards. He began. He studied law in the UK, studied law in England, uh, and then he went to work as a lawyer in South Africa, where he had his earliest awakenings uh, to the uh, independence move movement or the, the fact that colonialism uh, was, uh, was wrong in his view. However, what you probably don't know is that Gandhi was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize no less than five times, but somehow failed to win the award. And when you think of some of those who have been awarded it quite recently, you'd wonder what the poor man would have had to do to win the damn thing. So uh, Gandhi was murdered here. That is the exact spot where he fell. And this is in New Delhi. Uh, this is Birla House. And Gandhi was here uh, post-Indian independence. And he was here on a hunger strike. He was protesting the continued division and strife between Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs. Now, a million people died in the partition riots, uh, and you know, many more were, were dispossessed as they had to move between, between the, the, the country of India and the newly created countries of Pakistan and East Pakistan, which would later go on to become Bangladesh. And Gandhi, he was dismayed, firstly, at the fact that the country had to be partitioned, but the, then even more dismayed at the killing that then took place uh, across, uh, especially particularly in the regions close to the borders in Punjab and Bengal. And so his solution was to try and go on a hunger strike to persuade his countrymen uh, that this was not a good way to protest. Uh, but some of them didn't agree and he was shot dead. Who were the suspects? Well, the British clearly could have been in line to kill Gandhi. They weren't best pleased that Gandhi had managed to wrest from them the, uh, the jewel in the British crown. Uh, India. The Muslims. Muslims weren't very happy with Gandhi, who was a Hindu, a Brahmin Hindu. They felt that the Muslims who had remained in India were now second-class citizens, and, they, and some of them blamed him for this, for this. 
Hindus, uh, people of his own caste, weren't very pleased with Gandhi because they felt that he had not um, managed to um, avoid giving away his vast tracts of land to Pakistan. A disgruntled Brahmin, a Hindu from his own caste, so for those of you who are not aware of the caste system in India, uh, it, uh, there are four castes, beginning, beginning with the priestly caste, the Brahmins, and uh, you cycle downwards from there. Uh, and then below the Brahm, below the, the lowest caste, you have the untouchables who are technically casteless, uh, and they are the ones who have traditionally been downtrodden. They, they, they actually uh, call the Dalit community in India, and they are normally asked to do work well, throughout history, have been asked to do terrible, all the terrible jobs. Uh, and it was so bad at some points of Indian history that uh, a Brahmin would not, uh, or most Hindus would not drink from the same well as Dalits and Brahmins, strict Brahmins would not even allow the shadow of, a, of an untouchable, a Dalit to fall on them for fear that they would be contaminated. And Gandhi hated this. Uh, Gandhi was, uh, was very much in favor of trying to equalize society and life for the Dalits. Uh, and of course, you can imagine that the, the, the highest caste, the Brahmins, were not very pleased with this uh, for obvious reasons. If you're, if you're at the top of a particular pyramid, you're not very likely to want those at the bottom to suddenly come and share your to the spotlight with you. What we know for sure is that the butler did not kill Gandhi. He was an ascetic and he wasn't, uh, he wasn't inclined to have butlers and limo drivers and the like. So a little bit about me. So this handsome couple are my parents, my late parents. Uh, my dad was born in pre-partition India. He had to move across as a child to Pakistan where my mother was born. And then 50 odd years ago, they moved to the UK, which is where I grew up. I was born in London. I grew up here. I studied here at the London School of Economics. And I uh, decided very early on, uh, before I went to the LSE, that I was going to be a writer and I was going to be rich and famous. And I wrote my first novel, age 17. Uh, I was reading Terry Pratchett. I don't know if we have any Pratchett fans here. I was reading his wonderful Discworld series and I thought, well, this looks easy. And so I wrote my first novel, a comic fantasy. I finished it. And then I had the talk with my parents to tell them that I wasn't going to university. Uh, and you can imagine Asian parents. You can imagine what they had to say about, about that. It, didn't, it wasn't a very long talk, let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, my first book was obviously rejected. Uh, there was a problem with my cunning plan which was that the book was rubbish. Uh, as you can imagine, at the age of 17, uh, not many of us can write very well. I spent another 20 odd years writing uh, different novels, getting better and better at, at the craft of writing before I was finally published, but we'll talk about that in a second. And this, uh, this is me with my brothers and sisters, and you can see I'm modeling a very fancy uh, mirror-worked uh, waistcoat there from the 70s and a lovely hairstyle. Uh, that is called the Asian how to save money hairstyle. Basically, they put a basin on your head and just cut around it. <laughs> I like to pretend later on that I was, I was a fan of the Beatles and that's why I had that haircut. Now, I, at the age of 23, I became a management consultant and I was taken to India by my company to work for a contract. And this is the person who took me to India, my ex-boss. Terry Brewer, a lovely gentleman from Kent. And we, as you can see, this is, uh, this is two decades ago, 1997, which is why we're dressed like a pair of Sicilian gangsters. <laughs> uh, but this is in Bombay or Mumbai, as it's now known. And I ended up spending 10 wonderful years in, in India. And, uh, you know, I saw India change from being the um, almost pre-industrial economy to the near global superpower that we think of uh, as uh, of India as today. And what I noticed was that there were two Indias. There was the new India, you know, glitzy supermarkets and call centers of which you've all been the beneficiaries. Um, and also you've got old India, you've got caste prejudice, uh, poverty on a scale that we can't imagine in this country. Uh, you know, the first time I went to a slum uh, in India, in Bombay, it was incredible. Families of six or seven, uh, cramped in a single room dwelling, uh, no uh, sanitation in the region, no uh, transport infrastructure. And yet life went on. People carried on. Um, you know, they were mad about Bollywood films and cricket. Uh, the only difference was that they didn't pay for the films. They just stole the cable line from next door. So 
you know, for me, this, this clash between old and new India has become markedly more pronounced over the last decade as wealth uh, from outsourcing, from uh, globalization has flown, has flown into the country. And when I got back to the UK and I wanted to put all of those great memories of India into a novel, um, I did so. And one of the things that ended up in that first novel was this, uh, an elephant. And I'll explain in a second. And this was one of my earliest encounters with an elephant uh, on the streets of Bombay, which is, you know, it's quite remarkable to wander around the cities of, of India and you, and you just turn a corner and there is an elephant walking down the road. It's not something we routinely see in the UK, unless you've had a few too many on a Friday evening, I guess. Um, but all of that ended up in my first book. So I was published at the age of 40, 23 years after I submitted my first, first novel. I'd long since given up the idea that I would be published, but I got a big deal from a big publisher, Hachette Hodder. And uh, they put me on BBC Breakfast to launch the book. And so uh, things went a lot better than I, I could have possibly dreamed of. And this book is about a policeman who retires in his late 40s. Uh, from the Mumbai Police Service, forced into retirement because of health reasons. And on that last day that he retires, he uh, is confronted by the dead body of a local boy, a poor boy from the slums. And he realizes his seniors don't want to investigate. And so he decides to go off and, and investigate himself. But what also happens on that last day is that he inherits a one-year-old baby elephant. Now, what do you do in Bombay if someone sends you a one-year-old baby elephant? They're only about, they're quite small. They're only about that big. Uh, but you live on the 15th floor of a tower block, as most middle class people do. In it. But you have to buy the book to find out. But the point is that the, the elephant isn't magical. It doesn't talk. It doesn't sing. It doesn't fly. It's a symbol. It's a metaphor for India. And what it allows me to do is to add a gentle note of humor uh, throughout the series. Uh, and the books have been compared by the national newspapers to Alexander McCall Smith's number one ladies detective agency, if we have any fans in the room of those books. Uh, mines are slightly darker in tone. Chopra is a serious man, um, and he, uh, you know, he, like me, has a social conscience, and some of the things that he sees in modern India do not appeal to him greatly. And I use these books as my lens to explore modern India, the, both the dark aspects and the light aspects, because we often, we often mythologize India. We turn her into a land of swamis and snake charmers, and there's plenty of that. Uh, but the truth is that Indians don't get up and dance and choreograph numbers every five minutes. Um, and if you happen to be born uh, in a slum, you don't win the lottery. You know, life is relentlessly tough and hard and difficult, and you're exploited and abused. I uh, very much like being in the cabinet, I guess. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't get political, should I? Uh, anyhow, so that book led to four more books in that particular series. Um, and in each of them, I, I explore a different aspect of, of modern India. So the third one, because I'm a huge film buff, uh, it's about the kidnapping of a, a, a Bollywood film star. And it allows me to go into the history of, of Bollywood, which many of you probably don't know, is older than Hollywood by about a decade. More people watch Bollywood films than watch Hollywood films in terms of sheer eyeballs. And of course, that's a function of the fact that there are one and a half billion Indians. Um, uh, and the fifth book in that series so that fifth book is about the Parsi community. And I've been just chatting to a wonderful Parsi gentleman, Peter, today. And that book is about a community that we don't know a lot about in the West, so I've discovered. Uh, so the Parsis came to, to, to India from Persia, and they are, uh, they are not Hindus or Muslims, they are Zoroastrians. And uh, Muslim, unlike Muslims, Hindus and Christians who, who bury or, or cremate their dead, they leave their dead out in a, a process called excarnation in towers of silence. Now, these are stone structures in the middle of Bombay, in a wooded area in the middle of Bombay, and they leave them for vultures to, to, to eat. Now, uh, one of the things that ha that's happened in recent years is there has been a, a lot of dispute because those towers of silence were built centuries ago when there was plenty of space around, bomb, uh, around them. Now we have the encroachment of, of dwellings and, and tower blocks, et cetera, around, around there. And so what we've had is the, um, the issue of local residents complaining. There was one case 
for instance, where because these vultures uh, tend to sometimes take away snacks, um, you know, you've had bits of bits of body dropped into people's homes, uh, balconies. Uh, and, you know, there was a case where somebody made a big noise about this. Uh, and, you know, there's been a movement to try and get the, 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 the Towers of Silence moved outside. But the Parsis quite rightly say, well, how can you do that? This is sacred land to us. Uh, and so, you know, that, that debate rumbles on. And this is what a Tower of Silence in Bombay looks like. And there are the vultures just awaiting the next uh, incumbent. Having written that particular series, I then decided that I was going to write historical crime fiction because when you live in a particular place and you do a lot of research, you, start, you become at some point interested in how that particular case ca place came to be. And for me, the roots of modern India, to a great extent, were established in that period just after Indian independence. When the British, after 300 years, first with the East India Company and then the Raj, they left or at least they handed over the reins to, to India. And in, the Indians had for many, many years um, been at the lowest rungs of the Indian civil service. So they hadn't really had a taste of power. And many of the things that happened in that brief period when uh, Nehru, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru took over as Indian prime minister, uh, established the kind of country that India wanted to be. So what it was the world's largest democracy, 300 million Indians, but what kind of democracy was it going to be? And Nehru was a great friend, ally, and uh, almost a, a pupil of Gandhi. So he believed in Gandhian ideals and he wanted to see a more uh, egalitarian, equal society. So he veered towards a social democracy. When you're writing crime fiction, obviously you have to choose your period. And for me, this was a period just after Indian independence that was not been widely explored in fiction, certainly not in crime fiction. Um, the only book that of note that I can think about during that period is a, a book called A Suitable Boy, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, that's a literary novel, a fantastic novel, uh, you know, the longest, one of the longest novels in the English language. So if you do read it, be prepared to spend the rest of your life reading it. Uh, this is Mr. Mr. Nehru with his uh, chiseled chin. Uh, what kind of, the India that he was dealing with. So this was in the shadow of partition where, you know, as I've mentioned, millions of people uh, had died. And, you know, we have to be clear, it was Indians killing Indians. You know, the British had some, some blame uh, to shoulder with partition, but ultimately it wasn't the British who agitated for the breakup of India. It was the Indian Muslim League uh, the All India Muslim League, who felt that perhaps after the British left, they might be left as second class citizens in the country. And so uh, with Jinnah at the head of that movement, they, they uh, asked for a separate homeland and ultimately it led to communal violence. Uh, but after the new countries had been established, uh, there were other problems that Nehru had to deal with. He had the noisy neighbors, he had Pakistan. Um, there was a lot of saber rattling between the two countries. Uh, and he had feudal agitation because he was trying to make the landscape fairer. And so the old zamindars, the landowners, he was trying to get them to give up their land, to give the, the old nawabs and maharajas to give up, give up their uh, rights. And that's bloody difficult to get anyone to give up wealth and power. So it was a real struggle for him. Bombay, even then, was the city of dreams. It was the home of Bollywood. Uh, it was known as Bombahia, uh, and that is because... Bombay was not, it was not an old city. Uh, it was a series of marshy islands. And then 500 years ago, the Portuguese arrived and built a harbor and they called it good. Uh, and Bombay here just means good harbor in Portuguese. And about a hundred years after that, they gave or gifted Bombay to King Charles II when he married Catherine of Braganza. Now he didn't think much of this uh, bog in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so he, uh, he leased it to the East India Company. And the East India Company are the ones who silted in the marshes built the rail network and invited settlers from all over the empire. And that's when Bombay's population began to skyrocket. And so today we have something like 20 million people in the greater uh, metropolitan area of Bombay or Mumbai. Uh, and if you, as a basis of comparison, I think London is only eight, 8 million. 
Bombay was in 1950 uh, a city of jazz, city of good times. Even then, well, most of the big hotels had jazz quartets, usually from America, uh, playing every evening. Now, I strongly suspect, I strongly suspect, I strongly suspect that that is not Mr. Gandhi. <laughs> Now, the book that I wrote, the, the first book in my new series, um, it was, I wrote it because of a single inciting fact. And that is this. I did not know until I did the research that thousands, tens of thousands of foreigners continue to live in India with thousands of them continuing to live in Bombay. Many of them Brits, but also Europeans and Americans. I had just assumed that all of the Brits left in 1947, but that was not true. Many of them were there because they could not imagine any other life. They'd been born in India, raised there. They had businesses, they had property, they had servants. And why would they want to come back to cold, wet, miserable England, where they'd have to make their, make their own chai and drive themselves around? Others had been asked to stay on or asked to come to India to help India take over the reins. Uh, because, as I said, for many uh, for centuries, Indians had not really had any say in the administration of their own country. And so this was a way for, to get the experience from those who knew how to do this. And that's led to this book, Midnight at Malabar House, which came out a couple of years ago. And uh, in this book, I introduce Persis Wadia, who is uh, a Parsi from the community I just talked about. And she's India's first female police inspector. And, uh, you know, she qualifies at a time where the country uh, is quite patriarch uh, patriarchal and nobody knows what to do with her. So nobody wants to work with her as the only woman on the force. So they put her in Bombay's smallest police station at Malabar House with all the rest of the misfits and undesirables. Uh, and then, as chance would have it, have it, a senior English diplomat is murdered in his Bombay mansion and the case lands in Persis's lap. And so she... Uh, she pursues that case. Um, and it just so happens that that senior English diplomat, I named him Sir James Herriot. Uh, some of you may remember the name. I did not actually know that until a reader wrote to me and said, why did you name him James Herriot? James Herriot was a good guy. Um, <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, I did not realize. What, uh, um, and Persis is working with an Englishman named Archie Blackfinch. And he is a criminologist, a forensic scientist with the Metropolitan Police. And he's one of these Brits who've been called out to India to help uh, set up a forensic science lab for the Bombay Police Service. And of course, they, 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 they don't get on uh, to begin with, but as the series goes on, there is a will they, won't they vibe that goes on between the pair of them. And that book uh, has, been, um, has been quite successful. It's, it won the, the, the biggest prize in the world for historical crime fiction. Uh, called the historical dagger, and that's a picture of the of the dagger. Uh, it's currently um, shortlisted for another big global award. Uh, so you know it's done better than I could have possibly imagined. Why is historical fiction so hard to get right? Now I'm I rarely talk to an audience who are so knowledgeable about history. So you know, to me, it's uh, it's it's a little daunting. Maybe if I've got any facts wrong today, do do forgive me. Uh, I blame my sources. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of Hilary Mantel. She's with the same agency that I'm, I'm with. And if you're interested in history, uh, Hilary uh, has some great things to say about it. She did a series of lectures which are available online called the Wreath Lectures. And she says that the writer's job, the historical writer's job, is to recreate the texture of lived experience, to activate the senses and to deepen the reader's engagement through feeling. And that is precisely what I set out to do because I write crime novels. So there's got to be a murder. There's got to be uh, an element of mystery an intellectual challenge for you as readers. But at the same time, I'm fascinated by that period in history because I have a personal connection to it, clearly because of my ancestry. And I want to explore it in a way. I want to explore it through the eyes of an Indian, through Persis's eyes. We've had lots of commentary uh, about India through the eyes of, of, uh, of Westerners. Uh, but because I straddle both, I grew up here, but I lived there, uh, I, I wanted to try and do exactly what Hillary suggests that I do, and that's to try and engage you with that period in Indian history. 
why did I choose a female detective? Because my first series had a male detective. I'm clearly not a, a woman. So why, why did I? Well, it's one of those things where I thought uh, there is a message that I could send with this writing. Because, you know, writers, we sometimes get, a, get carried away with ourselves and, and we, want to, uh, we want to say something about the society that we live in. And India, unfortunately, even today, to a certain extent, uh, is a society that is not as equal as it should be. Back in 1950, it was quite paternalistic, uh, sometimes misogynistic. Here's an example of an advert from, <laughs> from, from the 1950s. Uh, uh, so, you know, if, you, uh, if you're training, training, uh, training your daughter up to be a housewife, make sure you buy an Usher machine, not any other kind of sewing machine. But when I started to do the research, I realized there were actually some fascinating stories of women who had broken the mold, who weren't prepared to be, um, uh, well, weren't prepared to be raised in this way. Not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with this, because obviously it's a function of its time. And, you know, um, good luck to, 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 to many women who, who chose to be housewives. My own mother was a housewife and she had a sewing machine and, and earned money <laughs> and she earned money through, through it so, to, to help us. So I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying that there were examples that went counter to this. And this lady is one of my favorites, one of India's first female pilots. Her name is Sariya Takral. Now, Sariya married into a family of pilots at a very young age. And after a while, they realized that she was asking questions she was quite in intrigued by, by, by flying. And so they decided to teach her. And then, uh, you know, when they felt she was ready, they, they took her over to the, the uh, the airport and uh, they, the Bombay Flying Club, I think it was called, and they put her next to this lovely, I think it's a gypsy moth, and they said, well, if you can take that up and bring it down without crashing, you can have a pilot's license. And thankfully she did. But isn't that a wonderful picture? It, a woman in a sari with a big old aviator cap, it's just a fantastic, fantastic slice of history. This woman is the one that my character, Persis, is based on. This is India's first actual female police Inspector. Now, she didn't qualify till a decade after uh, Persis, but uh, as I said, the, for me, the, the period just after independence, independence is slightly more uh, intriguing, so I wrote, I wrote her there. Uh, but Shanti Parvani went on to become an ACP, um, an Assistant Commissioner of Police, so a really successful and inspiring, inspiring woman. Now, to get back to the murder mystery that we started with, now, that dapper young man in the center there, that's, that's Gandhi. As some of you will no doubt recognize from his South African uh, years. He wasn't a very successful lawyer in South Africa, I have to say, which is the, one of the reasons why he came back to, uh, to India, although I'm happy to be corrected. Now, I realized that I have a close connection to Mr. Gandhi. I live in a place in London called Canning Town. And as I was walking around Canning Town a few years ago, I came across this, the Gandhi Chaplin Memorial Garden. It's just a very small green space. Now, for the life of me, I could not work out why in the east end of London, there was a Gandhi Chaplin Memorial Garden. And so I did some research. And the answer is this. Charles Chaplin was an enormous fan of Gandhi. So much so that he used to write to Gandhi in India, begging for an audience. And Gandhi, um, he would turn to his advisor and he would say, who's this Chaplin fellow who keeps writing to me? Bearing in mind, Chaplin was the most famous, probably the most famous uh, actor in the world at the time. <laughs> and, and his advisor, who didn't know much more than Gandhi, used to tell him, I think he's some sort of clown in America. <laughs> well, then Chaplin discovered that Gandhi was coming to London for, for talks uh, about Indian home rule with the British government in the 1930s. And he, uh, once again, he begged Gandhi to meet him. And this time Gandhi agreed. And here they are. This is 1931 in Canning Town, just a yard from where I live. Two of the most famous men who have ever existed meeting at the home of a Dr. Katyar. And, Ga uh, and Chaplin came away from this meeting utterly enthused. You know, he wrote loads about it, you know. He, he, for, so for everyone else, Chaplin was the film star. But for Chaplin, Gandhi was the film star. And partly that could be to do with the fact that, you know, Chaplin's films were rooted around, uh, you know, the poor man, 
uh, the tramp character and, and, and that kind of thing. And Gandhi was, of course, always advocating on behalf of, of the poor. And in fact, when he came to East London, he became a huge celebrity. He was loved. Everywhere he went, he was mobbed. Except one place. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Churchill, uh, who has, of course, many virtues, uh, but one of them is not liking Gandhi. He called him a half-naked, seditious fakir. <laughs> so, who killed Gandhi and why? Well, this is Gandhi's murderer, a man named Nathuram Godse. Godse was a Hindu nationalist, and he was one of those who uh, believed that Gandhi had not been strong enough in giving up the, um, the territory to Pakistan. And uh, in the end, he conspired with, some, with, with others, and he came to Delhi, and he shot Gandhi dead. He tried to then shoot himself, uh, but he bungled that, uh, and he was captured. And... Uh, with seven co-conspirators, he was hanged on the 15th of November, 1949. Okay, so uh, let's talk about my latest book, because that has more of a connection to you guys, and it's the reason I, I guess I was invited to speak here today and why I was delighted to accept. So this is the Asiatic Society in Mumbai, and this is the society back in 1950s. And this is it back in 1830 when it served at Bombay's town hall. In fact, this was from it was from this society that the announcement of the of the Raj of the Raj era was made. And Gandhi's ashes were stored here after he was killed. This is what it looks like today. It's obviously had a lick of paint. I love this picture because you've got this wonderful modern looking building, and then you've got this this chap in his uh, with his roll on his head in the front of the picture. So I visited this, uh, this wonderful treasure trove of, uh, of historical artifacts uh, many years ago when I was living in, in India. Uh, it's been around for about 200 years, uh, and it was uh, set up by a, a Brit. And, you know, it's got some wonderful treasures. It's got uh, a, a Shakespeare first folio. Uh, it's got uh, both copies of Voyages Around the World by Cook. It's uh, supposedly got a wooden bowl that belonged to the Buddha, Gautama Buddha, uh, coins from Emperor Akbar's reign, etc. But the most valuable artifact that they have, oh, sorry, this is a, a recent refurbishment. It's swanky. It was just a few years ago. That they did, but the most valuable treasure they have is this a supposedly 600 year old copy of Dante's The Divine Comedy, one of the two oldest copies in the world. So they claim, uh, you know, other scholars have come along and suggested perhaps it's not quite that old, but it's certainly very, very, very old. And For those of you who, I mean, I'm sure most people here are familiar with uh, Dante's The Divine Comedy. It's, uh, it's about man's journey through uh, purgatory to uh, its ascent to heaven. And it's a really, it's, a, it's, about the, it's about the soul of man and how you can gain redemption for your sins and eventually make it to the promised land of, of heaven. And Dante uh, wrote this uh, with himself in the lead role. Uh, playing the person who is walked through purgatory, etc., up to paradise. And the book was incredibly important, not just because of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a poem in essence, but it, it's important because it also helped to define, it's, it's, I mean, it's obviously a work of world literature now, but it helped to cement the Tuscan dialect as the Italian language, amongst, amongst other things. But it also propagated a worldview, a church-based worldview of man and man's, uh, how man can recover from sin that has stuck with us even till today, I would, I would venture to say, although I'm sure there are Dante scholars who are much more versed than me uh, amongst the audience who can, uh, who can contradict that if they wish. But anyway, I thought it would make a great story, a great plot line to have the, uh, the book stolen, the manuscript stolen 
from the Asiatic Society. And then my lead character, Persis, come in to uh, investigate. Uh, because remember, it was a, it's a, it, it, Indians consider it a priceless treasure. But, and this is a fact, Benito Mussolini offered one million pounds for it back in the 1930s. He was a huge Dante scholar and he wanted, after he'd won the war, to build a huge Dante museum in Rome, uh, where it would be paired with the oldest known copy of the Divine Comedy. Uh, but the Indian government rebuffed him. And ever since then, uh, various Italian governments have attempted to buy the manuscript, but the Indian government has been resolute in saying, no, you can't have it back, we've got it. Uh, which has pretty much been the, the colonial motto anyway for lots of treasures around the world. So, so you can't blame them, I guess. In this book, the, uh, uh, the, the manuscript is stolen. And what also happens is that the curator of the Asiatic Society, uh, James Healy, an Englishman, he also vanishes at the same time. And when Persis investigates, what she discovers are coded riddles. And she has to basically solve those coded, coded riddles to try and work out where this uh, manuscript is. But as she does so, bodies begin to pile up. And so she realizes that there's, yeah, well, it's a, it's a crime novel, so bodies begin to pile up. So she realizes that there is a sinister force also looking for the book. And these are some of the nice things that other writers have said it. I mean, Anne Cleves, some of you may, may read Anne Cleves. She's a good friend of mine, and she was kind enough to, um, well, she, so, so I sent the book to Anne, right, after finishing it. And Anne wrote back to me, she said, Vaz, I love you, but I will only give you a, a review if I actually like it. Because Anne's a stickler. She's very old fashioned, Anne. She, she's a stickler. She won't give you a review and, unless she actually reads the book and likes it. And she was very kind to say some very nice things uh, about the book. This is the next one. And the only reason I put this up is because this is my first chance to gratuitously show off that cover. <laughs> I love this cover. I've just been sent it and I thought, you know what, I'm going to squeeze it in there. It's just an amazing cover. For those of you who like your podcast, I do a pub podcast with you know, famous crime writers. Uh, Anne's been on there, obviously, and anyone else you can think of, Ian Rankin, Val McDermott. We had, um, on the current episode, we've got Lord Geoffrey Archer. So he may be, it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but uh, he was very charming and he, he talked uh, with us about his uh, career, books, writing, and cricket, of which he is a huge fan, and so am I. I noted that you mentioned Peter Frankopan. So Peter is a, is, a, is a good friend of mine because we play on a team called the Authors 11. And the Authors 11 is a, is a 200 year old cricket team, which amongst its original members counted Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and P.G. Woodhouse. Um, and it's still going now with all sorts of prominent historians like Peter and Tom Holland. Some of you may know who Tom Holland is as well. So India of today. So the India of today is um, it's 1.4 billion people. Um, it was 300 million just 75 years ago. So you can see how busy they've been. Um, and, you know, for me to understand modern India, as I've said, you've got to dig into the historical period. And that's why I write historical fiction now. My website, if you want more information about anything that I've talked about, because I've been writing a series of free to look at articles on the, about Indian history, starting from the earliest days of the Indus, Indus Valley civilization. No doubt that's a, that's a topic that's been well explored in the Asiatic society. Oh, and this is a, sh a shameless request. <laughs> so I've been nominated for one of the biggest awards in the world for crime fiction. Uh, now with this one, the second stage, oddly, is some sort of public vote, apparently. So if you have a few seconds, all you have to do is go on there and just pick my book out of the list and, and vote for it. <laughs> and that pretty much uh, brings me to the end of my talk. Now, most of the talks that I deliver, I deliver a lot of talks. They're, they're at uh, fiction festivals, crime fiction festivals, book festivals, uh, where there's always booksellers. But, when I was in, but whenever I do a talk off the beaten track, I'm always asked, you know, are there any books available? So what I did was I brought some books from my publisher. And when I told them the connection to the Asiatic Society, uh, they, they said you could sell them at four pounds, which is obviously even it's less than half the cover price. I really don't want to have to carry them back. So if you fancy a book, uh, buy some, buy, buy them for a friend, buy them for a birthday, anything, just so I don't have to take the damn things back. But anyway, 
that is the end of my talk. And thank you so much for being a lovely audience and listening. <laughs> If there are any questions, I'm happy to spend a few minutes answering your questions. If you want me to answer them, yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Because yeah. it's kept in a vault. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. You know, um, there are, no. Yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's an English scholar whose name is escaping me. A few years ago, he went uh, to India to examine it and to, uh, to hopefully verify some of these claims about its age and its, and its provenance. Um, he sort of semi-concluded that it probably wasn't 600 years old. It might be slightly less. Uh, less, and he tried to figure out exactly how it arrived there by uh, Um And he, co he couldn't, he, there, there were bits and pieces of a clue, uh, but traders might have been responsible for, for bringing it and then Elphinstone bought it from them and put it there. But it's, I, there's no clear answer. You can go and you can find different answers online, but there's no clear, there's no clarity around that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm amazed you got to see it because they, they've locked it up in a steel vault for years now. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it only comes out, I don't know, once a decade or something. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. And maybe a couple of as well. Well, from what you've read so far, do you do you think that she's the type who wants to get married off? <laughs> So, so what's happening as the series moves on is, is obviously we have this possible romance with Archie Blackfinch. Now, there are two problems. There are two obstacles to this. One is the fact that the uh, Indian police service won't allow married women to serve, which I don't think was uncommon amongst many institutions back then, not just in India, but elsewhere. So Persis is one of these people who, are, who is ruthlessly ambitious to the point where, you know, if you read the books, you'll see she sometimes that ambition short circuits her common sense and she rides roughshod over people. And that was quite deliberate in the way that I characterized her, um, you know, so that she has moments of realization when she realizes that she needs, she needs to curb that, in th that ambition, but she's so keen to prove to this world of men that she can do the job as well as they can, if not better, uh, that sometimes she does lose sight of the fact that uh, you can't just go charging on. That's also going to hamper her if she tries to get married. Um, and the other problem, of course, is that if she had to get married, to marry an Englishman in 1950, just three short years after um, the Rajas ended and Indian independence, um, that's a whole other kettle of fish that she would then have to deal with uh, in terms of her society and the people around her. And even if she was allowed to carry on in the police force, Marrying an Englishman would pretty much kill any prospects of moving forward, you'd have thought. Um, so, you know, it's a very, very difficult proposition for her. At least she's not getting married in, in either that book, the third one, or the fourth one, which I've just finished drafting. <laughs> <laughs> but things do get very complicated with Archie. Are you able to give us a little sort of... Yeah, so the, lo okay, so the lost man of Bombay, uh, so that begins with uh, an, uh, a white man found dead in the, in the foothills of the Himalayas, not far from Dehradun, which some of you may have heard of. 
And uh, that case eventually ends up with Persis. There's a connection uh, to that body to, to Bombay, but nobody knows who it is. Uh, but it becomes you know, a, a cause that the Indian government wants solved because it's a white man. And suddenly everybody, all the newspapers are carrying this story of, well, this white man frozen to death up in the mountain. How long has he been up there? You know, what's, who killed him, et cetera, et cetera. And then other murders begin to happen in Bombay. So we have two different sets of two investigations, which in the best traditions of these things will hopefully eventually meet up at some point in the book. Oh. Well, I think that was an offshoot of the fact that uh, bad day at the Vulture Club, if there's any more left there, but bad day at the Vulture Club, I'd become so fascinated um, with the history of the Parsis and the way that uh, they embedded themselves in Bombay society and become incredibly influential and wealthy for a very small community. How had they done that? And also because they'd worked very, very well with the British uh, in terms of you know, being able, because they were highly educated and business-minded, and they were able to, to work uh, to, with the British in a way that some of the other communities weren't able to. And so all of those things, because, you know, my books are sold around the world, but they are l largely sold in Western to Western audiences. And one of the things you have to do as a writer is to try and keep points of relevance, points of interest, uh, and points of commonality so that readers have something to identify with. That's why I kill a lot of white people in my books. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's one of the reasons why I thought the Parsis would make a, a really intriguing community for her. So my favorite character in this series is actually not Persis, it's her dad, Sam Wadia. Now he's an old man in a wheelchair. He's incredibly cantankerous. Um, you know, he's lived through a lot in his life. He's lived through independence. He's lived through an accident that took away his his ability to walk, he's lost his wife many years ago. He's had to raise purses pretty much on his own. He runs a bookshop and they live above the bookshop. And, uh, you know, he's seen and done everything. And he's one of these uh, cantankerous old men who simply won't, uh, who won't uh, be told anything. So, you know, have a lot of fun with him as a character. <laughs> Just to add, uh, kudos to that, of course, the Parsis were very active in the opium trade between uh, uh, India and China. Well, I'm going, to ask, ask, I'm going to have to ask Peter about that. Yeah, were, you, yeah. were you very active in the opium trade, Peter? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Do you want to pass the pipe around? Like Hong Kong, I used to walk past the um, Parsi temple every day. But anyway, because they also um, gave a lot of money for building hospitals. But anyway, as you said, because they worked extremely well. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It made a fortune for. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't. It made an absolute fortune for enterprising Englishmen. So there was. Professor Albert Hinter, Soas, sort of big European Research Council, around the moment. Okay, cool. Brilliant. So we should have a lot of information. Fantastic. I thought you were. I didn't know where you were headed there. I thought you were going to say she's got a big opium field or a big opium factory. Sorry, there were a couple of questions there. Thank you very much. Do I have friends? Yeah. yeah, that's one of the reasons why I became very interested in the community. When I went to India, I didn't know anything about the Parsis, but I made a friend called Homi. Um, and he was the one who introduced me to his community and, and, and their lives and, and, and the rest of it. And that stayed with me so that when I came back to the UK, eventually I ended up writing one book with a Parsi character and then carried on from there. Um, well, he still writes to me. So, <laughs> so I, I haven't been struck off his uh, Christmas card list yet. <laughs> Uh, 
So, you know, I do a lot of workshops, um, writing workshops for, for budding writers. And one of the things that many of them don't understand is how, is how the publishing industry works. The publishing industry uh, is not your enemy. The agents are not enemies, they, they, but they only make money if they can sell the book. It's very much more of a commercial enterprise these days. So they have to find a business case. So what happens is when a book is submitted, to a publisher, they sit around, they make a business case, how many copies can we sell? I know it sounds a bit soulless, but that's the reality of it. There's still room for invention and all the rest of it. But the single biggest reason why agents reject manuscripts is because the quality of the writing, the quality of the prose is not to the level that can be published. So they know they can't send it forward to a publisher because it will never see the light of, of day. And I, so one of the things that happened to me is obviously when I was 17, the prose was awful, awful. It's cringy when I go back and look at it. But because I was writing every day, editing, reading, no matter where I was working in the world, like anything else, you know, you get better at it, whether you're playing tennis or eating hot dogs in America or whatever. I mean, if, you, if you're going to be a hot dog champion, you've got to eat hot dogs every day, I guess, lots of them. And it's the same with, with, work, with writing. You've got to write lots and lots of words. So by the time I got to my fourth novel, the feedback from agents was changing from oh, go jump off a cliff and never write another word to we like what you're writing, but it's not quite right for us. Uh, but send us the next thing that you write. So I think in the end, what happened was a set of circumstances where I was writing about uh, something that I cared deeply about, a place that I lived a place in crime fiction that hadn't been explored very much in crime fiction with the added element of the baby elephant thrown in, which was a marketing angle that I think they could hang some of their PR on. So I think that's what really did it in the end. So. <laughs> why you went? I suppose why you went to Grace Kings. And whether any other choices you chose. Because you know, I've gone to a university of literature. Were you something halfway up? Because I think I know the answer. I'd love to hear you talk about what your choices were. I love your liberal use of the word choice. <laughs> <laughs> There was no choice. There was no choice. Look, my parents were old fashioned. My dad was not an educated man. He was a very hard worker. He spent his life in an industrial bakery. And his only ambition was that his kids would be educated. That's the only thing that he cared about. The fact that we would go to university and we would bloody well work hard and, and, and earn money. Correct. And of course, the, this is an old joke, but you know, the Asian communities, it's, it's, it's accountant, lawyer and doctor for your kids. There, there, no other professions exist. I studied accounts at LSE. <laughs> there was zero, zero chance of studying English literature, none whatsoever. You know, I don't, to be honest, I don't hold it against my parents because I've had a great life. And I know, I, I, but I've had, a, for, for, for younger writers, I do sometimes tell them that, look, don't throw all your eggs into one basket because it's so bloody hard to make a living as a writer, if you don't achieve some level of success. So what you don't want is to wake up at the age of 35 with no other qualifications, no other career, and realize you're not making enough money even to feed yourself. I know writers like that. So I've had a relatively good life because of the fact that my parents forced me to study and work. Um, I think probably the point that we have to um, yeah. stop and thank such an interesting talk. I know there's probably other questions that people would like to ask, maybe, you know, penetrating ones like the one we just heard. I shouldn't put you on the spot. But um, so I'd hopefully you join with me thanking him formally for well, it's well, been my pleasure. so well entertained. It's, been my, it's been my pleasure. Projecting, well, taking us through this murder mystery. <laughs> it's um, been my pleasure, absolutely. Anyway, thank yeah. you very much. You're welcome. And if anybody's got a book and once it's signed, just let me know and I'll, I'll sign it.